Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Growing hemp isn't legal in Virginia, but the state's first research crop has been grown and harvested. If you want to raise fresh garden vegetables well into early winter, check out these crops. And while organic and non-traditional farming is popular with some consumers, traditional agriculture still pays the bills for most farmers. Welcome back everyone. We're coming to you from Renwood Farms in Charles City County where corn and soybeans are a major crop and we're going to have more on that story a little later on. But first, legal cultivation of hemp ended after World War II. Now 70 years later, Norm Hyde tells us that researchers are trying to revitalize this versatile crop. Hemp was one of the first crops planted in the New World. It was so valuable, settlers at Jamestown were required to raise it. Hemp is not new. Hemp was grown in the 1700s here in the valley. It was shipped down the river behind us on barges. So we're just bringing back an old crop and trying new things with it. Hemp cultivation essentially ended in the U.S. after World War II because of its similarity to marijuana. While they are from the same plant family, there are no psychoactive ingredients in hemp. Seventy years later, farmers and industry are trying to revive hemp as a crop in Virginia. In 2015, the Virginia General Assembly approved issuing licenses to grow hemp for research purposes only. Supporters of hemp say the opportunities are endless. So historically, yes, we used hemp to make sails, to make rope and other types of cordage. Um, but more recently, uh, scientists and industry are figuring out other ways to use those fibers. And so, for example, in Europe, uh, they are taking the fibers and putting them into blow molds, uh, making door panels and things like that that have high degree of structural integrity um, and they're lighter in weight. Um, so that's kind of the fiber side. We're finding new uses for the fibers. But if you look at the seed from a human nutrition standpoint, it's very nutritious. It has a higher omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid profile than um, than traditional grains do. Professor John Fike at Virginia Tech planted several hemp varieties at a research farm in Montgomery County. He says any concerns about marijuana growers hiding their crop in a hemp field are groundless, since they would crossbreed and destroy the potency of the pot. If you look out in Oregon, I think it is, there are certain counties where, you know, they've, they have allowed industrial hemp, but there are certain counties now where they're, they're making it illegal to grow industrial hemp because it is messing with the marijuana growers' uh, viability, shall we say. Thanks to $165,000 in grants from the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, hemp was raised on five Virginia sites in 2016. One of those was a cornfield in Rockingham County, where the owner already makes his own biofuel and was eager to take a chance on hemp. I've always had an interest in alternative crops, particularly energy crops. We grow canola as an energy crop. We crush it and make biodiesel. And hemp is another crop that is a, has a great potential as an energy crop. Right now we're harvesting the crop. Then we'll take the oil seed, we'll run it through a press. When we extract the oil from it, we'll convert that to biodiesel. The press cake that's left over will feed livestock. And then the stalk that's left in the field uh, we'll bail that and use that for animal bedding. Professor Michael Renfro of James Madison University was overseeing this research plot. On a hot September day, Rhodes and some friends were using a soybean combine to harvest their hemp. It went well at first, but things started to bog down. Renfro says that's all part of the experiment. Even though the seeds are mature, the stem still has a lot of moisture in it. And because it has that wonderful long fiber, those fibers tend to wrap around machinery. So um, that can be a challenge. 
So far we've been pretty lucky. We've had a few snags along the way where we've had to stop and, and clean some of the hemp fiber out. With so many options for using industrial hemp, there's a lot of enthusiasm among some farmers. But they must apply through the Virginia State Police and the Drug Enforcement Administration for experimental hemp permit. They cannot sell it for use off their farm. And it's very difficult to obtain hemp seed since it has to be imported. You know, a lot of people say this is, well, it's kind of, they treat it almost as, as if it's a miracle crop, right? Well, you know, no herbicides, no pesticides, no nothing. You know, we can grow it without anything. And that's just not true. Fike says the whole hemp harvesting and processing network has to be rebuilt. At the same time, growers are trying to find new markets for this old crop. And the General Assembly has to lift the ban on commercial production. So it could be a few years before industrial hemp is a valuable commodity in Virginia. Even so, Fike hopes there'll be at least several thousand acres of hemp grown in Virginia over the next five years. In Rockingham County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. Hemp production predates written history, although historians believe it was first raised in China. Hemp was brought to the New World with Spanish explorers as early as 1545. Its principal use was for making ropes and sails in colonial America. By the time of the American Civil War, hemp had been mostly displaced by imports of cheaper jute and abaca fibers. The 1937 Marijuana Tax Act essentially ended commercial hemp production in the U.S. by forcing the few remaining growers to register and pay a tax to produce hemp. Hi, today we're going to be talking about broccoli and cabbage production in the fall from the ground up. Please stay tuned. From our farms to your table, Virginia dairy farm families are dedicated to providing your family with nutritious, high-quality milk. I'm Dan Myers fifth generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I'm Roy Vanderhyde, a first generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I'm Gerald Heatwool, a third generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I am dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and our land. Fall is a great time to raise coal crops like broccoli and cabbage. Today, Chris Mullins with Virginia Cooperative Extension shows us how to have a successful harvest from the ground up. Well, hi, today we're at Fauquier Education Farm uh, with Jim Hankins, the executive director here. Jim, thanks for letting us come out and see some of the things you're doing today. Today, we're gonna be talking about fall planting of cabbage and broccoli. Now, this is something I think some people like to grow especially in the fall. Is that a good time to grow these? Oh, it's an excellent time for, you know, the cool season crops. You have to remember you don't, only, you're not limited to just planting them in the springtime. You can plant them just as well in the fall okay. if you baby them enough to get them established. Right, because it's some hot weather right now. It's hot weather right now. You know, a big mistake an awful lot of folks make is that they think that they're going to be doing a fall planting. Well, I don't have to plant it until the fall. Here it is, you know, early September. It's too late to start from seed. You're going to need to go to a good garden center. Okay. Fortunately, they have an awful lot of plants that are widely available. You know, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, yep. all of that brassica family are good candidates for those fall planting and just baby them through those last hot days of the summer. Get them lots of water when you first plant them, I'm, I'm yep. guessing. When you first get this tray, you've got to soak it, soak it, soak it. And when you put them into the ground, you have to soak that ground and soak it. You've got a commercial planting here behind us, and you're growing on plastic mulch to keep weeds down and things like that. What could a home gardener do? Would they put mulch down? A oh, a, a hay mulch, hay or straw mulch is an excellent thing. And, you know, you just leave that hay and straw right on the ground. It will decompose over the winter. You're improving the soil. Okay. You know, I really like the black um, landscape fabric, the woven landscape fabric, anything to try to control your weeds. Um, okay. But these guys are pretty easy. 
if you can get them established, don't worry about the fact that these will not be mature before the last, before the first frost. Okay. You know, there'll be frost in October that will actually make these sweeter. Jim, these are some nice transplants here, cabbage and broccoli. Is it, what, how old are these? Um, these cabbages are about six weeks. This, okay. is the, this is the size you really want, which means that they were started in mid to late July. Okay. These little broccolis are about five weeks. They're still fine. You know, they will not mature until after the frost, but that's an important thing about these cool season crops. These guys can do perfectly fine with those first few frosts in October. Now, I know with transplants, I can see here uh, there are a couple cabbage loopers, right? Yep. Cabbage loopers are going to be your primary pest for these guys. And, you know, in the springtime, the cabbage loopers come out at the end of production. So it will be a little bit of damage on the leaves. In the fall, one cabbage looper can just devastate this plant while it's still really small. They're really easy to control, but some insecticide, there are perfectly good organic insecticides okay, to great. use that are really effective, but you have to do something. You can see this tray of broccoli. The broccoli is a lot more attractive to them than the cabbage. Right, right. and it can get away from you quick. Oh yeah, <laughs> it, you know, those caterpillars eat 24 hours a day right. and they can grow from a quarter of an inch long to an inch and a quarter in just a couple days, and the next thing you know, you've got a plant that's just a stem. Well, great tips. Thanks again for letting us come out here today and visit the farm. It's in such good shape. And for more information about cabbage or broccoli production in the fall, please contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins, and we'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Chef Maxwell has a delicious recipe for a hot, hearty stew. That's up next in Heart of the Home. Cooler weather means that some people are yearning for a hearty stew. Today, Chef John Maxwell brings us a recipe from the old world for rabbit stew in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Chef John Maxwell. Welcome to Heart of the Home at Meadow Hall in Meadow Event Park. Doswell, Virginia. We're going to play with something a little unusual for TV. I've got a rabbit and we're going to make rabbit in the Madeira style. Now Madeira uses the Madeira wine but it's named after the island of Madeira the, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean um, where Christopher Columbus's wife was born. Right, we'll get into that later perhaps uh, but first we're going to start with this rabbit. We're going to braise this right, which means we have to cut it up into sections and I'm going to do that now. Right. Just taking the pieces off. Now you can do the entire rabbit, and I suggest that you do, but you can also get rabbit in pieces. And if you want them in pieces, just ask for the pieces you, you need. And uh, the legs are the pieces that do best in this recipe. So I'm just going to put that over there. All right. I'm going to cut this into a slightly smaller chunks and put it down in seasoned flour. I can usually bounce those little pieces into a cup. Okay, so we're going to take these and it should be almost hot enough. I'm always messy with flour. So I'm going to brown these off in here. And what we want to do is just brown this off a little bit. We're not going to actually cook the rabbit in this stage. I mean, this is going to take a couple of minutes. We want to get that nice and brown on one side, then we're going to turn it over. All right. The rabbit pieces are kind of browned off. I'm going to pull them out. All right. All right, so I'm going to add some garlic. 
and I'm going to add some fennel, and I'm going to add some chorizo sausage. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of chorizo sausage. This is a Madeira Island recipe, so it's best with good Portuguese style chorizo sausage, which is not real hot. Right? Um, the Spanish style that you can get from South America or from Spain is pretty hot. Now, fennel is an interesting almost anise or uh, tarragon y, uh, licorice -y kind of taste. Um, and the capital of the Madeira Islands is a city called Funchal, which it means fennel in Portuguese. So uh, this is one of the reasons why this dish gets its name. Okay, now we're going to add some tomato paste. Right. And we're going to do a process called pincé. Now, pincé means to cook the tomato paste until the oils start to separate. Right. It caramelizes the tomato and the sugars in the tomato, which makes it a little sweeter. Now, we're ready for the wine. We're going to deglaze this pot with some wine. And I've got Madeira wine. I'm going to put it in there. Now, wine, of course, has alcohol in it. But alcohol evaporates at 170 degrees. We're cooking this at 312. So as soon as it hits the pot, that alcohol is gone. It evaporates out. So there isn't any there. All right, now we're going to add right, some onions, some turnips, some leeks, and stir all that up. I'm going to add some chicken stock. And let that simmer. I'm going to throw a couple of bay leaves and a little bit of thyme. And now the rabbit goes back. Now comes the hard part. We have to watch this pot until it boils. No, I'm just kidding. This is going to take about 30 minutes uh, on, on low heat to kind of simmer and go and cook that rabbit until it's good and tender. I can't wait to get into this. And I'm going to take a few of these pieces out all right, and center them on this. Make sure I get some of all the vegetables. Sprinkle it with a little bit of parsley. Uh, and we are all set with a rabbit stew. Actually, it's braised Madeira style rabbit. There we go. Every week, we make recipes using great Virginia grown food. We make them in our kitchen so you can make them in your kitchen. Join us next week on Heart of the Home when we get to play with more great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on Chef Maxwell's website, chefjohnmaxwell.com. Rabbits are one of several specialty meat animals raised on Virginia farms. According to the USDA, there are 290 rabbit farms in the Old Dominion. They sell mostly to specialty butcher shops and directly to consumers at farmers markets. Other unusual livestock raised in Virginia include alpaca, bison, deer, llamas, and mink. There's even an elk farm. Milk from sheep and goats is another unusual livestock product. And honeybees are even considered livestock, even though they are insects. There are bee colonies on more than 1,800 farms in Virginia, producing more than 317,000 pounds of honey each year. Traditional agriculture has been vital to Virginians since it began in 1614. Today, farmers are continuing to build their businesses based on their lessons from their forefathers to provide safe and affordable food. 
Virginia farm products are recognized for their quality around the world and farming is big business in the Old Dominion. It is the main thrust of agriculture in Virginia. It's what, why Virginia is known as an agriculture capital. Um, you know, it contributes to our, our economy. It's the number one private industry in Virginia, um, contributing $52 billion a year to Virginia's economy. And um, when you add forestry in, it's a $70 billion uh, plus to Virginia's economy. With the global population predicted to reach 9 billion by 2050, many Virginia farmers know modern farm methods will have to be used to raise more livestock and crops on farmland that's already in use. Most people, most lay people would be uh, surprised to know that that, uh, that science has allowed our farmers to use less fertilizers um, on their crops, but to have greater yields. And I mean, even at Virginia in, in corn and wheat, our farmers uh, often hit the records, you know, nationally for better yields, and that's that's because of science. David Hula is one of those modern farmers. He has been recognized for several national corn crop yield records and is a fourth-generation Virginia farmer. In 2015, his corn yields topped 532 bushels an acre, currently the highest corn yields in the world. Just think from my granddad, he saw for from working behind a mule to a man on the moon. We don't see those drastic changes, but the changes are happening very much from a standpoint, particularly in the seeds again. You know, we go from the Roundup technologies to now we have insect resistant plants. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine report that genetically modified organisms or GMO produced foods can benefit human health with increased vitamin A. Dozens of scientific reviews over decades have found that the GMO crops do not damage plant or insect diversity and have been boosting the diversity of insects in some fields. Meanwhile, indoor animal handling systems allow livestock producers to raise healthier animals with fewer resources with the added benefit of holding down cost. Yeah, that means Virginia's more modern more agriculture is helping feed people here and worldwide. $3.19 billion worth of exports going, going out of Virginia. They're selling soybeans, they're selling grains, uh, they're selling animal products, um, poultry, um, and in some cases cattle and calves outside of Virginia. So not only is traditional agriculture important to Virginians and to the United States, it's important in the world economy as well. While there are 139 certified organic farms in Virginia, the great majority of farmers are traditional growers like Hula, and most traditional producers are family farmers. In Virginia, there are nearly 46,000 farms, and almost 90 percent of those are owned and operated by individuals or families. It takes dedication, experience, and deep roots in farming to succeed at such a high-risk career. I'm the third generation here on the, this farm, fourth generation in Virginia. The fifth generation works with us. I was blessed to work with my granddad. My dad's retired, but he's still around. I have two brothers that I work with and a son now. So, you know, that's, that's exciting. It's been said that by 2050, our population's going to be, I think it, the last figure was 9.6 uh, billion people. And so we're going to have to continue to find ways to more efficiently grow products. And I think Virginia's going to be a big part of that so that we can feed, feed the world population. I think traditional agriculture will will continue to be important and become more important. The good news is traditional farmers have met the challenge before and will again. In the 1960s, one American farmer supplied food for 26 people in the U.S. and abroad. Today, a traditional production farmer supplies food for 155 people in the U.S. and abroad. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching, make it a good week. Home